It's not that imagining failure causes failure. It's that imagining failure causes success. Because if you imagine failure, you can see all the obstacles that might be lying in your path, and then you can actually do something about them before you run into the obstacle. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Artists of Data Science podcast, the only self-development podcast for data scientists. You're going to learn from and be inspired by the people, ideas, and conversations that will encourage creativity and innovation in yourself so that you can do the same for others. I also host Open Office Hours. You can register to attend by going to bit.ly.com forward slash a D S O H. I look forward to seeing you all there. Let's ride this beat out into another awesome episode. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a five star review. Our guest today is a poker champion turned author, consultant, and corporate speaker who's here to teach us how to get comfortable with uncertainty and make better decisions. She's earned bachelor's degrees in English and psychology from Columbia University and pursued a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, where she was awarded a National Science Foundation Fellowship to study cognitive psychology. All that changed a month before her dissertation defense when she shoved her research into the trunk of her car, told her professors she'd be gone for a while, and headed west, where she eventually found her way to a poker table. As a former professional poker player, she was once the leading money winner among women, having won a World Series of Poker bracelet, placing first at the World Series of Poker Tournament of Champions, and winning the 2010 National Heads Up Poker Championship before retiring from the game in 2012. As an author, she's written six books, including Thinking and Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts, and How to Decide, Simple Tools for Making Better Choices. She's also the co-founder of the Alliance for Decision Education, a nonprofit whose mission is to improve lives by empowering students through decision skills education. So please, help me in welcoming our guest today, the Duchess of Poker and best-selling author, Annie Duke. Annie, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here today. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you pulled the Duchess of Poker out. So let me tell you a story about that. When I started playing poker, it was like 1994-ish when I started playing for real. And then like right around 2002, 2003, it ends up on television. And all of a sudden, like poker players end up with like agents, which was very weird. If you knew what poker was like in the 90s, the fact that anybody would have an agent would be pretty hilarious. And I had an agent, like the first agent that I had, I ended up switching really thought the idea of having nicknames people would be a really good idea. And so he tried to push the Duchess of Poker. Uh, and so it lingers around, but it wasn't something that I actually used for myself because I was like, no, I'm just Annie Duke. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm good. I don't need the nickname. So I think it's hilarious that you like dug that one up because it does, that you sort of see it around the internet a little bit. It's like this lingering thing from like 2003 that kind of sadly, <laughs> you know, stuck. <laughs> You could thank Wikipedia for that one. That's yeah, like, exactly. That one out from. I so, love that you brought it up, though. I think it's so funny. Yeah, I used to watch Poker After Dark a lot. When love I was, that show. Morris and Nani, who's the producer of that, is such a gem. Yeah, and I remember seeing you on that show when I was coming up. And yeah, they used that term. I was like, Ooh, that's such a cool, cool name, the Duchess of Poker. But Annie, before we get into the awesome work you've done, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about where you grew up and what was it like there? Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, I grew up in the capital of New Hampshire, a place called Concord. Not to be confused with any of the Concords uh, in the U.S. We pronounce it a little differently in New Hampshire. I grew up in there, but it's a little, I had kind of a weird existence because of what my dad did. So my dad had grown up in West Philly, actually went to West Philly High. His father never, I think he... I'm not sure if he finished sixth grade. If he did, that was the last grade that he did. 
And then my dad actually went to West Philly High and then ended up going to Haverford College and then made his way to Harvard. So it's like, I think it's like a real American story of like the sixth grade education to my father ended up with a PhD, like in one generation. So my dad got into Harvard Law and after the first year, he decided to drop out because he realized that his passion was teaching and he, he really wanted to be an English teacher, much to my Jewish grandmother's dismay. Um, but so through that, he ended up getting a job offer after he got his master's in English at Harvard to teach at a school called St. Paul's School. And St. Paul's School is one of these like elite boarding schools. It's actually Episcopalian. And you know, it's kind of like what you would imagine, you know, if you think of like the Dead Poets Society or something, right? Like it's what you would imagine in terms of, you know, an elite boarding school. Only 500 kids go there. A lot of kids from like New York go there. So my dad got hired there in, gosh, I think it was like 1961. And he was like the token Jew, like he was diversity at this Episcopalian school. So I had this very strange existence because obviously my grandfather, you know, it was not you know, he wasn't really wealthy. So we, we, we were obviously living on a teacher's salary. There were a lot of perks, but so we were not rich. Um, but I grew up among incredibly wealthy people. So that juxtaposition was always, always kind of interesting for me. I was at an Episcopalian school and, you know, obviously Jewish. There were just all these kind of like schisms in my life, which I think is interesting. So I'm actually, I think, a pretty good code switcher because of that. So anyway, one of the huge perks that uh, came with teaching at St. Paul's was that your children could go to that school for free. And that school, you know, cost as much as a college cost. So this was, this was a really big deal that we got to go there for free. So I, I went to St. Paul's as did my siblings and then went on to Columbia after that on financial aid. And that financial aid turned out to be like a, an amazing turning point in my life because as part of my financial aid package, I needed to do work study and applied for a bunch of work study jobs. And the one that I ended up taking was with a professor whose name was Barbara Landau, who was a professor in the psychology department. And she had got done her PhD work at the University of Pennsylvania with Lila and Henry Gleitman. And I actually ended up being her research assistant for four years. And then she really encouraged me to go to Penn and pursue my own PhD there. And, you know, it's a super random. It was like, I was kind of trying to choose among work study jobs and I just happened to click with her. I don't think that at that time I was thinking like I want to pursue an academic career, but she really encouraged me to do that. And I'm incredibly grateful for that, for that stroke of luck. And what kind of kid were you in high school and what did you think your future was going to look like when you're in high school? (laughs) So it's kind of interesting because, well, for, I mean, I was a good student, but I really felt very keenly that I was a misfit at that school I went to school with people whose last name was Rockefeller. My dad was like Richie Letterer from West Philly. I think I would say that I would call myself disaffected. (laughs) That's what I would say. I was kind of disaffected. Um, I had this real drive to make sure that I was succeeding academically. But I think socially it was very tough for me, partly because I didn't quite fit in with the people who went there. And also partly because I think that I just felt those differences. So I was just like, I don't think I was like particularly super friendly either, right? Like I I was sort of staying to myself. And then the other thing about sort of my high school experience, my childhood was that we did not have necessarily the most functional family because my mother was a pretty severe alcoholic all the way through when I was through high school. So I don't know. It's interesting because I I don't think that I was really thinking about like, what do I want to do with my life? I was thinking like, I need to succeed and get good grades right now so that I can go to the school that I really wanted to go to. And by the time I was in junior year, I knew I wanted to go to Columbia because I really wanted to be in New York. During the summer between my junior and senior years in high school, I actually lived in New York and did temp work for a summer, really fell in love with the city. I wasn't doing like an internship or something. But then in my senior year, you had the opportunity to do like an independent study. And so I spent the winter term of my senior year actually working with autistic kids at Bellevue Hospital kids who were so severely autistic that they were hospitalized at that, at that time. Um, and so I started feeling like I wanted to do something in psychology kind of at that point. But I don't know that I ever had like a super broad plan because I think at that time I was really focused on just like getting out of the situation I was in. I wasn't particularly happy at the high school that I went to, despite the fact it was an amazing education for sure. 
but I wasn't particularly happy at that high school and my family life wasn't like super happy either. And so it was like, let me just get to the next stage and then I think I'll think about it then. Thank you very much for sharing that. So from this kind of set of experiences, very unique experiences you had, how did the inspiration or idea or did those experiences cause an inspiration or idea for your books? Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, obviously, you know, the main thing that's kind of going on with my books is this conversation between my graduate work in cognitive psychology and poker, for sure. I think there were a lot of reasons, though, that I was attracted to poker because we did the happiest times that I had as a child were actually playing card with my family. And my father is like an incredibly lovely man, by the way. And my mother actually, she had many good qualities. It's, you know, she had a disease. She's very funny. She was very smart super sharp. So, you know, it's just, you had a disease. So what are you going to do? So I think that I had been playing cards a lot when I was young. And so, you know, I obviously sort of had some experience with that as I was sort of going into when I went into poker, but I do think that there's this kind of theme of uncertainty and the limited ability that we have to predict the future. And that if you can get a little bit better at that kind of anticipation, you're going to be better off. And if anybody who's grown up with somebody where their parent in a situation where their parent is really alcoholic, one or both of them, what they know is that there's a a much higher level of unpredictability that occurs in those situations where in particular with my mom, you didn't quite know like what kind of mood was she going to be in from one day to the next. The other thing was that the mapping between kind of like your deeds and what her reaction to them were, I think were much more capricious. So I could clean the kitchen and get yelled at, or I could clean the kitchen and get a lot of praise, right? So there was a lot of noise in that. So I think that you just kind of get super used to like that kind of uncertainty and you're really focused on like, how do you navigate that in a way that I think was certainly helpful for me later in life. But also I think that that undercurrent informs everything that I write about, like, you know, the fact that the future is much less predictable than you think it is. Um, Certainly something people are finding out during coronavirus that maybe things aren't as predictable as I thought they were. But I think that that's something that I was kind of growing up with in that sense. So speaking about cognitive psychology and poker, kind of a big question here. So I apologize in advance. What are bets? What are decisions? And what's the relationship between them? Oh, okay. So decisions are bets. (laughs) So let's start there. That's easy. What do I mean by that? Betting is basically saying I have some set of limited resources that I can invest into, and I'm choosing among options where how that option turns out is not deterministic. It's probabilistic. So you can think about a flip of a coin. If I flip the coin, it could be heads or tails. Very occasionally on this land on the side, we'll ignore that. So let's just take heads or tails. And so I can think about when do I want to invest my money into a coin flip? even though I can't control whether it lands heads or tails, I can think about whether it's an appropriate investment. So that would depend on what the pricing situation was. So if for every dollar I won, I lost a dollar, that would be pure gamble, meaning I should break even in the long run because it will land heads or, you know, I'll be 50% at calling heads or tails. If I were offering you a dollar and 25 cents for every dollar that you lost, I would be losing. That would be a pretty bad option for me to invest in. And if you were offering me a dollar and 25 cents to my dollar, obviously I should do that all day because I will make 12 and a half cents on every flip. So, but we don't need to just think about it as money because you're also investing things like your time, which is going to give you the best return on your time. We make choices about different types of return, like return in health, for example, return in happiness. So it's not just returning money, But it's essentially saying I can't choose every single option at once because I don't, obviously I can't do that because I'm a finite human being. Um, And so what options am I going to invest whatever my resources are in, which in a probabilistic sense are are going to get me the best result over time? That's what a bet is. That also happens to be what a decision is. And then we can take it a level deeper and say what that means is that bets and decisions both because they're the same thing. The decisions are really at their core forecasts of the future. So like, you know, if you're trying to decide between the chicken and the fish, what is that decision? It's a decision that uh, for whatever the returns are that you're trying to get from your meal, it could be choosing the healthiest thing. It could be choosing the tastiest thing, whatever, that when you choose one option over the other, it's on a probabilistic level, you know, it's going to be more likely to return you the thing that you would like. So if I'm choosing between chocolate cake and a vegetable stew and my choice is health, 
presumably I'm going to choose the vegetable stew, stew because I think that that's going to return me more health than say the chocolate cake. I might decide when I choose a chocolate cake, if my value is I want something that's the tastiest, that may be the thing that I choose. And then often the choices are closer than that. It's like, uh, you know, chicken breast versus fish where the health is going to be similar uh, and you're thinking about enjoyment and whichever one you choose is just a prediction of which one's more likely you're going to produce a happier version of you in the future. What's up, artists? I would love to hear from you. Feel free to send me an email to theartistsofdatascience at gmail.com. Let me know what you love about the show. Let me know what you don't love about the show. And let me know what you would like to see in the future. I absolutely would love to hear from you. I've also got open office hours that I will be hosting. And you can register by going to bit.ly com forward slash a d s o h i look forward to hearing from you all and i look forward to seeing you in the office hours let's get back to the episode so speaking about options and outcomes i think maybe more than sometimes we tend to look at an outcome and we work our way backwards if it's a particularly bad outcome And we say to ourselves, hmm, I think I made a bad decision. So why is that really not a productive way of thinking? Yeah, so we can just go back to this relationship that I just said between uh, uh, the decision you make and the outcome that you get, right? So we're living in a probabilistic world, meaning that there are very few decisions that you can make that are guaranteed to have one single outcome. So even if you make a decision where 99% of the time you observe a great outcome and 1% of the time it works out disastrously, 1% of the time it's gonna work out really bad. (laughs) That's the whole point, we don't have control. So if you take, for example, a situation like Pete Carroll in the Super Bowl in 2015, he chose a pass play, that pass play was gonna be intercepted somewhere between one and 2% of the time, and it got intercepted. Because by definition, one to 2% doesn't mean zero. It means one to 2% of the time, and we don't have any control over when we're going to observe that, that difference. So we're kind of pulling apart the relationship. We're discorrelating uh, decision quality and outcome quality in, in the short run. Obviously, in the long run, it plays out, but not in the short run on any individual decision. But as decision makers, we act like those things are correlated essentially at one. So If we know what the outcome of a decision was, it was intercepted. What we think is that that tells us something really significant about the outcome, about the quality of the decision that actually undergirds it. And the interesting thing is that what's really happening there is that we're ignoring this uncertainty that we've been talking about. Because if you take a game like chess, for example, that doesn't really have a strong influence of luck and certainly not a strong influence of hidden information because you can see all the pieces. If you and I play a game of chess, and I lose, we actually do know something about my decision quality. Why? Because the pieces don't move around at random. They only move by acts of skill. So the only way I can lose is if the way that I was applying the skill elements of the game was worse than the way that you were applying the skill elements of the game, which is why we can actually work backwards in a game like chess. But in a game like poker, we cannot do that because if you and I play poker for about the same time that a chess game would take, say, an hour, We know that I can lose because, you know, I'm Pete Carroll and 2% occurred, right? Like I could only lose if exactly the queen of clubs hit on the last card and lo and behold, the queen of clubs hit on the last card. Now with any of these things, if you get enough iterations, obviously, right? If we played poker for 1500 hours and I lost to you, we could say something about my decision capabilities compared to yours, but certainly not in the short run. And yet we see example after example where this is actually how the mind works, that we get this real cognitive illusion that outcome really does tell you something about the decision quality. That's certainly true in the case of Pete Carroll, because five years later, we're still talking about it. But another recent example is actually from the 2016 election, which I think is really interesting. So we know that Hillary Clinton lost, right? And we know that she lost three states in particular. (laughs) which were Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. So knowing that, the general consensus in the country is that she bungled her campaign and she made a huge mistake. 
So the question that we want to have is, well, is that resulting, right? Are we under the same cognitive illusion that we are in the Pete Carroll case where, you know, he calls a play that's only going to fail in the particular way that it did between one and 2% of the time. Um, and it fails in that way. And we all think he's an idiot, right? Is this is the same thing happening in the analysis of Clinton. And the Clinton example has an advantage over the Pete Carroll example, which is because the Pete Carroll example is happening in real time, there's no way to go back and look at the quality of his decision except in retrospect, right? Because we, because it happened very quickly. But presidential campaigns actually happen over quite a long period of time. So I don't know, can you think of anything where in real time people are an, analyzing the decisions that are being made more than a national presidential election? Not off the top of my head, no. No, right? So, and we can see this now with Biden and Trump. There's lots of stuff being written on Biden's campaign strategy and Trump's campaign strategy. Lots of people talking about the polling. What does the polling mean? Uh, what are the odds of different things happening? There's just, I mean, there's volumes written on it. So here's the thing with the Clinton case. What I would argue is that if she were making a really big mistake, spending proportionally many more resources in places like Florida and Arizona and North Carolina and New Hampshire and Virginia than she was in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. If it were true that that was a huge mistake, that somebody certainly would have written about it at the time. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Right, because like you only have the information that you have at the time that you're making the decision. And at right. the time, places like Florida and New Hampshire were polling as toss-ups. Mm -hmm. uh, places like Wisconsin and, and Michigan in particular were pulling quite far ahead, Pennsylvania slightly less so. So when you're thinking as a campaign, like, where do I want to be spending my time? Obviously, you're trying to swing these close states, right, over, over into your column. And at least as far as I can tell, because I Googled it, there isn't, nobody's writing that she, oh my God, can you believe what an idiot Clinton is because she's not spending time in these three states. Now, there are plenty of articles that say that, but the first one that appears is on November 9th, which is the day after the election. Yeah. So this is how you can tell this is a case of resulting. And it has an advantage over the Pete Carroll example because we, can, we actually have a record of what people were thinking at the time. And, you know, we know that across those three states, she lost those three states by something like 77-ish thousand votes, like somewhere around 80,000 votes, literally across the three states. So... Those could have gone either way. Like the chances she loses all three seems like pretty infinitesimally small. I mean, I'm sure they're correlated with each other to some degree. But I think one of the states she lost by 10,000 votes. Like, how can we, like, what? And there was a polling error for sure in those three states, but there wasn't a national polling error. There wasn't any polling error in Florida. There was no polling error in New Hampshire. Like all of these other places actually pulled fine. Some places, actually, the polling error looks like it was in the other direction. So as I recall, Virginia, actually, she won by a much bigger margin than the polls had predicted. So sometimes it goes in the other direction. This one happened to go in Trump's direction. But here's the thing about a polling error that everybody seems to forget is that you don't know there's a polling error until the vote has been taken. Yeah. <laughs> so you can only know it after the fact. So I think this is like a really good demonstration of resulting. And you can see what the, the sort of after effects of that are. I mean, first of all, we're calling something a bad decision that probably wasn't. So that's bad because that's the only thing we have to learn from in life. But it also affects future decisions, right? You're hearing people talk about like, oh, you have to spend all your time in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, but that might not be the right strategy for this particular election. In fact, I would argue that the polling in those three states are probably going to be much more accurate than they were in 2016 because the pollsters have the scars of finding out that they had underrepresented white voters without a college degree. And obviously they're working to correct that. So you might expect actually it would be more likely to have a polling error somewhere else. And this is a really important resource allocation question because campaigns have limited resources. So if you're taking the wrong lesson from 2016, you may actually be misallocating your resources. So these things have really big effects. So it seems kind of irrational to take that line of thinking where we say, okay, bad outcome means bad decision. So, and I think that kind of is part of the... Well, not question. if you're playing chess. <laughs> not if you're playing chess, yeah. But why is it that our brains are not built for rationality? There's a broader question, but let me talk about the resulting problem just really quickly. So the thing is that, like, decision quality is actually just really hard to derive. If you take the Pete Carroll example, I can assure you that if we do the math, the past play was actually an incredibly high-quality decision, but it's complicated, I have to sort of, you know, draw out the whole decision tree. And what that means is that I have to ask you to 
kind of hold your horses on applying causality, any opinion about causality, and start to explore all the other branches of the tree, right? Not just the branches where he passes and it's either caught for a touchdown or it's just incomplete, but also like the branches where he hands it off to Marshawn Lynch or it's fumbled or whatever. Likewise with Clinton, what are all the branches where she has the exact same strategy in those one or two or three of those states in her direction in different combinations? That's a lot of permutations where maybe she wins Florida, right? Like there's a whole bunch of counterfactual worlds that could exist. And that's just hard. It's hard to do that when we know what the result is. Once we, you know, there's many possible futures, but there's only one past. And that one past ends up taking sort of all of our cognitive landscape, like it it fills our, our cognitive landscape such that we sort of forget, we sort of take this cognitive chainsaw to other, all these other branches, all these other worlds that could have unfolded. And we lop those all off the tree and all we're left with is the trunk. Now, once we know sort of what the past looks like. In other words, the thing that actually happened, and Michael Mobison talks about this quite a bit, there's a part of the brain, which you call the interpreter, which immediately tries to apply causality to things. And what the interpreter is not gonna do is, oh, that was unlucky, that was random. It's just kind of not the way our brains work. Our brains um, uh, really like to make a, you know, create a narrative that makes sense, where one thing leads to another in kind of an orderly fashion we really aren't comfortable with randomness. And when we think about some of the other cognitive biases like illusion of control, which is just that we have more control over our future than we do, an explanation of randomness doesn't really fit in with that narrative. And I think that it just would sort of make you feel like you don't have, you know, the world is sort of out of control. And interestingly enough, that's actually related to why people believe conspiracy theories. Because the explanation of just crap happens, like random stuff happens. And sometimes there's not like a global cabal that's trying to make it happen is I think kind of, you know, it's just not satisfactory to the way our brains work, which are really causal interpreters. That's what we are. Um, We're pattern recognizers. There's actually a word called apophenia, which is seeing patterns where they don't exist, which obviously conspiracy theory belief is in there. And it's not correlated with intelligence because it is just kind of like Some people are more so, some people are less so, but we're all sort of causal interpreters. And in fact, some of the most intelligent people are the most adherent to conspiracy theories because I think that they can create, they can give these arguments and narratives for patterns. So that's, I think that's specifically why it is like resulting occur. But in terms of the other biases, it's just, you know, you always have to trade off efficiency and accuracy. And You know, I mean, I think the classic example is just we're sort of built for false positives, right? Where sensitivity for us is very high and we sacrifice specificity for that. When if you have some suspicion that a lion is coming, we just assume a lion is coming and we run away. And that's been quite good for the survival of the human species. So, you know, and there's all sorts of other things that are like that. So a couple of things I want to dig into there. First of all, let's start with the beliefs. It seems like we tend to inject a whole bunch of our own beliefs into any decision-making process. So how could we turn decisions inside out so that we can free ourselves from our beliefs? Yeah. So I'm glad that you asked this because I think this is one of the main differences between thinking in bets and how to decide between those two books. So thinking in bets, a lot of it was kind of like an exploration of luck, kind of what's happening when you're sort of injecting luck into the equation such that we don't really know what to say about why an outcome occurred, right? Because these things are kind of pulled apart. And how to decide I took as a a place where I could really explore this kind of informational belief knowledge, you know, sort of how that is influencing things in kind of a bad way or or maybe a good way if we could make it do that. And I think about that, that sort of like intervening at a different place in the decision cycle. So luck is intervening after you choose a particular option, like you flip the coin and while it's in the air, I say heads. Whether that lands heads or not is a matter of luck. So luck is intervening between the decision that you make, the option that you choose, and the particular outcome that you happen to observe. That's where luck is intervening. Where the problem with uh, the information that we have is intervening, just the fact that it's incomplete in comparison to omniscience, where that's intervening is actually before that. So you've got your beliefs, and those are informing the options that you choose, 
they're informing what you think your goals are, your beliefs. And I don't mean beliefs like religious beliefs. I mean, beliefs like all the knowledge that you have combined, the, the models that you have of the world, the perspectives that you have of the world, the way that you think about the world. Um, that's what I mean by beliefs. I just want to clarify that. But it's informing kind of all the process that happens afterwards. What do I think my resources are? What are the goals that I'm trying to reach? What are my values? What are the different options that I can consider if I'm considering a particular option? What do I think the possible ways that are reasonable that that option could turn out are? What do I think the probability of those things occurring? That's all being informed by your beliefs. So you have your beliefs and then you have the option uh, that you choose and incomplete information is intervening at that stage. Okay, so we can build an amazing decision process. I can, I can like map out for you, here's how you make a great decision in terms of the process of choosing options. And if the foundation that that process is sitting on is faulty, I don't care how, what I built you, right? Because the data, the inputs into that process are, aren't gonna be good. And that's essentially the situation that we're in pretty much for every decision that we make. Because the foundation of that process is your beliefs. And your foundation has two weaknesses. Weakness number one is that a lot of the stuff you, that you believe literally right this moment in your life is inaccurate. And of course we know that that has to be true because we can think about both kind of the arc of humanity, like uh, humanity as a whole used to believe that the sun revolved around the earth and now we don't think that anymore. So there's something that used to be inaccurate that we've corrected. And we know that there are going to be things like that that we're going to find out in another five years, 10 years, 100 years. Gosh, when it comes to coronavirus, it seems like you have to revise your beliefs every week or day. I don't know. Information seems to be coming quite fast. So, and then think about your own life, not just the arc of sort of human knowledge. I know for me, there's lots of stuff that I believe very strongly when I was 20 that I look back at and I'm like, whoa, I was actually, that's quite a bad thing to believe. So then it stands to reason that the beliefs that you have at this moment in time are not perfectly accurate. So that's the first problem with that foundation. And let's say that those are cracks in the foundation. The second problem that we have is there's just a whole bunch of stuff we don't know. So, because we're like human beings, we're not omniscient. Uh, we certainly don't know how the future is going to unfold. That's a bummer. Uh, but also there's just like, I don't, I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know what facts you have. I don't know like all the knowable things there are about the universe. And this is actually a really big problem. Like the stuff I know could fit on like the head of a pin and the stuff I don't know is like the size of the whole universe. I mean, that's just kind of the problem. And so we basically have this really sort of cracked and flimsy foundation that's informing the beliefs that we have. If you think about, okay, so how can I kind of solve for that? And that's really where my focus is in, in how to decide. It's not just, obviously, I, I show people how to construct the decision process, like, because you need to have a sound decision process, but then most of the focus is on this belief issue, right? Like, how, how do you actually become more accurate in the things that you believe? Well, we know how we can correct both of those problems. If some of the things I believe are inaccurate, and I also don't know a lot of stuff, the way to solve for that is to go explore the universe of stuff that I don't know. And to explore that in a really objective way, where I'm kind of like maximizing my ability to run into information that uh, is different than the things that I believe to be true, to run into new information. So corrective information, new information, and also to run into, I really want to kind of maximally run into people who have different points of view than I do. Because two people can be viewing the exact same information and they can come up with very different answers about what it means because people are applying like different mental models or mathematical models or algorithms or whatever. Um, and so I'd really like to be able to collide with those as well because that's where, where all of the antidote is to the problems with the foundation of, of the decisions that I make. So that's what I want to be doing. The problem is, as you previewed, that we don't do that. We don't interact with that world in, in any kind of way that's actually random. It turns out that most of the way that we're sort of interacting with the world and most of the way that we're thinking about our, our own decisions is from the inside view. In other words, it's from the little speck of dust of the facts that we have, the knowledge that we have, the beliefs that we have, the models, the way that we've modeled the world. And when we actually go and interact with the world of stuff that we, you know, that, that universe of stuff that we, we maybe don't know, we do it in a specific way to, shot, to specifically maximize the chances that we're shining light on something that already agrees with the belief that we have. We interact with new sources that agree with us. We interact with people that agree with us. The way that we talk to other people actually reduces the chances that even if they did agree with us that we would know about it. 
Um, so we're kind of trying to hide, avert our eyes from facts that disagree with us. We're not interacting with people who disagree with us. And if they do happen to disagree with us, we're kind of trying to make sure that we don't actually find out about it. And we can think about this as like a, an inside and outside view problem, which is the world from our own perspective, from that little speck of dust that is the stuff that we know would be the inside view, right? Is that we're interpreting things within the things that we believe to be true. And what that means actually is that we don't actually view information objectively. We'll interpret the information in order to fit our beliefs. And the antidote to that is the outside view, which is actually getting to this world of stuff that we don't know, things that are true of the world independent of our own perspectives or the way that other people might be viewing the situation that we're in. And that's the thing that, we're all, that we just sort of naturally are trying to avoid. But if you really are thinking about how can I improve my decision making, what you have to do is say, I need to stop avoiding that. I need to try to maximize how much I'm sort of getting to that outside view in order to discipline the view that I have myself. And that's why being smarter makes it worse, right? Because you're consciously going out there and you're looking for information that's going to support and just help fill in the cracks of those foundations of your belief, right? Is that that motivated reasoning yeah, so the only the only word, word that I would take out of that is the consciously. Mm, okay. So we're all, everybody's doing this, right? So, uh, so what you mentioned is motivated reasoning, which is essentially you can think about like you have beliefs and models of the world that let's call it, it forms a trench and you're kind of down at the bottom of the trench. Uh, so you're trapped in the, that's the inside view. And ideally what we'd like to do is climb out of the trench and go and look around at the world and say, should I change my trench? <laughs> Should I try to climb? There's, is there something that tells me that this trench I'm in, that this, these very strong models that I have of the world, maybe I should adjust those. Not do a 180 necessarily to like I'm totally wrong, but like, man, if you're 2% off and you can shave that 2%, that's really, it's gonna make a big difference to you and your outcomes. So we don't do that though. So motivated reason is basically like as, as we sort of information is sort of floating above this trench, we're pulling the information down into the trench with us in order to interpret it in a way that supports the beliefs that we have. Now, we can see that all the time in terms of the interpretations that people have in terms of politics, right? Two people can look at the exact same video of a presidential candidate. And depending on what your beliefs are, some people will say, look, at that proves how brilliant they are. And other people will say, look, that, that proves, you know, what an idiot they are. Or... You know, you get this all the time. It's like, what is your interpretation of whether somebody is being serious in what they say? Well, it kind of depends on whether you like the person or you don't, right? So yeah, we, we hear this argument about Trump all the time where some people say, don't you know he's just joking? Well, so people who like Trump will say, don't you know he's just joking? And people who don't like Trump will say, this is a five alarm fire. He, we have to take this seriously, right? And you can see that it's exact, you're looking at literally the exact same information, but you're interpreting it to fit the model of what you believe to be true about the world. And this is happening, not just when it comes to things like politics, but also just things like, what route do you think you're supposed to take to work? Where when there's traffic and you're late, you'll be more likely to say, well, I just got unlucky, there, there traffic, if you think that that was a good route to take. But if your spouse who was arguing that you shouldn't take that route at all runs into the same traffic, they'll say, see, that's proof that that was a bad route. Right. So that's like a, in a small place. But, you know, it's also true just about like your sales strategies or the ta the business tactics that you're applying or whatever it is. The problem is that data is not truth. How you model it, we have to model the data. We're interacting with the data as human beings. And that's where motivated reasoning getting gets in the way, because the way that we're modeling the data fits our beliefs. Now, this is all this is not for the most part. Sometimes it is. But for the most part, this is not a manipulation or anything conscious that's going on. We don't realize that it happens. The person that we're really kind of trying to fool is ourselves mostly. And it's because, you know, it's what Dan Kahan calls identity protective uh, cognition. So essentially, the way that we think about the world is actually kind of motivated to protect our identity. And what is our identity but the things we believe? I don't know that there is another thing that's all right. It's like you believe certain things about the world and you have models of the world and this is sort of who I am and what I believe to be true. And that's kind of your identity. And so each individual belief that you might have really kind of are, the th those are the threads that your identity is woven out of. And so you attack a belief I have. If I run into corrective information and I have to now say that that belief is wrong, 
That's an attack on me. It's an attack on my identity, and we try to avoid those. Now, why is this worse for smart people? Well, because smart people are just better at spinning narratives. They're better at looking at a set of data and interpreting that data to fit the model that they already have. That's just why. It's just like this kind of narrative spinning that's kind of going on in our heads and this reinterpretation. You know, it's just like smart people are just kind of better at doing that. And then I think the other issue for smart people is that, and by smart, I mean like people who are subject matter experts or you know, have something that sort of makes them stand out in terms of the thing that they're thinking about. I think the other problem is that a subject matter expert is much more likely to take a glance at some data and sort of intuit what it means. And because they are subject matter experts, I think they're much more less likely to question whatever the intuitive response that they are, that where they just sort of glance at the data table really quickly. Whereas somebody who's maybe not so adept, for example, with data, is not going to have that same intuition about what the data means. And I think they're, they're going to have to dig into it a little bit more um, because they can't rely as much on their intuition because they're, you know, they just don't have a lot of expertise in that area. So you know, it's, particularly, it's a particularly big problem for subject matter experts, actually. Thank you very much for getting into that. It was really, really interesting. There's another thing you talked about, which was probably the, the thing that shook me to my core when I read Thinking in Bets. And you touch on it as well in how to decide. It's kind of about fielding the unfolding future, right? So I was wondering, you, you touched on it a little bit before, but I was wondering if you could take us for a ride through the decision multiverse. And <laughs> what is this place and how can we navigate it? Yeah, so the decision multiverse. So, you know, we touched on it a little bit. It, it's basically this idea that for any option that you choose, there's many, many different ways that the, that the future could unfold. So if we think about this like sort of as a retrospective problem, it's very difficult to understand what you're supposed to learn from any outcome that you observe unless you explore the multiverse, right? Like all the other branches that the universe could have taken, right, that that could have unfolded. So uh, there's a term for that, which is called a counterfactual, um, which is essentially sort of states of the world that could have been but do not exist now. Right. So you could imagine a situation where, you know, let's say that you got married when you were 30. There's another branch that your life could have taken if you had married your high school sweetheart, for example. Like, so that would be an example of a counterfactual. It didn't actually exist. A famous counterfactual would be like, what if Hitler had been born a girl? Then what does the world look like? Right. So so we want to be thinking about when we're observing any outcome in our lives, you know, the the past is caught for a touchdown or we hate the college that we chose, or we hired somebody and they quit within eight months, you know, like these, as we're sort of observing these outcomes that we're trying to learn from, it's really impossible to know what we're supposed to learn from the outcome unless we consider the other things that could have happened. So that's the multiverse, right? We have to sort of start exploring that multiverse in order to properly situate the outcome that happened in its appropriate context, which is the context of the other things that could have occurred. So, you know, one of the ways to address like the resulting problem or the hindsight bias problem is to start to do this, to really think, given that I am observing a particular outcome, what are the other ways that the world could have unfolded? And in particular, I think that it's really, really important to do this with your good outcomes. And the reason I think that that's so important is that I don't think we naturally do that. And when you don't naturally do it, it probably means that you want to. So let me explain. If you have a bad outcome, then it's kind of nice to go explore the multiverse because contained in that multiverse, what you get to find out is possibly you made a perfectly good decision and you got unlucky, right? It could be, yes, I got in a car accident, but it turned out I actually ran a green light, not a red one. So think about sort of like, if you think about like psychic pain, when you have a bad outcome, you feel really bad. You got in an accident. So if you go explore the the multiverse and you say, where does this outcome situated in all the other outcomes that could have occurred. Obviously, if I went through a green light, most of those universes don't contain my having gotten an accident. So now I can see, oh, I'm Pete Carroll and I hit a one or two percenter and it turned out that my decision was pretty good. So it's like you're trapped in this room of being sad and now exploring the multiverse allows you a door out that you can sort of walk out and say, well, now I don't feel so bad about that bad outcome because because it turns out I made a pretty good decision. But think about that from the reverse. What if you have a good outcome? You're you're like, oh, I feel pretty good about myself over here. 
right? Like, you, you know, our natural assumption is if, if I made it, if I have a good outcome, it must be because I'm an awesome salesperson or I knew that that college was going to be amazing and that's why I chose that college. Or look at this employee. They turned out to be a superstar. I'm such a great interviewer and, you know, I can sift through CVs really well and whatever. You know, you can think about kind of any, I, I chose the chicken and it was amazing. Look at how great I am at choosing things off menus. Like whatever it is, you feel really good. So what, what are you benefiting in the short run from exploring the multiverse? If all of a sudden you find out, actually, the reverse is true. The chances I was going to get the outcome that I got were only 2%. And it turns out like most of the ways the world was going to unfold were pretty crappy. Now, all of a sudden, you don't want, you don't want to find the luck anymore. Then you, you're sort of turning a win into a loss. You don't want to have a door out of that room where you won. Now, of course, that's true in the short run, but it can't possibly be true in the long run. What a disaster it is if you have a really lucky thing happen to you and it turns out that you just don't explore that. And so you think it was a great decision and now you repeat a decision that's actually quite a poor decision that has a very high probability of not working out for you over and over and over again. And I can tell you a real example. It's not so much anymore because I think that everybody would be embarrassed to say it. But I know when I was growing up, I had people who really legit claimed to me that they drove better when they were drunk. Legit. Because they had gotten home safely. And this is the thing that we're trying to avoid, right? Is that there's all sorts of examples where I can tell you every single human being, me included, has a billion examples of thinking that they drive better when they're, they're drunk. It's just that it's not as clear. It's like not so obviously a bad decision that we're able to do that motivated reasoning kind of interpreted in that way because we're not actually looking at the times that we win and at the multiverse, right? To say, what are the counterfactual worlds here? Like, what are the things that could have occurred and was this actually just lucky or was there good, a good decision? Or by the way, a lot of times the answer is gonna be, I made a pretty good decision and I got a pretty good outcome but it turns out there might've been a better decision. That's certainly true in poker. You can be playing poker and be making decisions that are winning, but it turns out that if you made a different decision, you would have won more. And I want to know all of that stuff because my goal is how do I become a better decision maker in the long run? Not how do I bask in the glory of my win, at, you know, every second that I possibly can in the short run. And this is something that I really like dig into in this book. And the reason why I dig into it in this book is because I think that I didn't actually convey this well enough. It's my fault. In thinking of that's where when I was talking about this problem, I had so many people say to me, and by the way, I'm relieved for helping them with their psychic pain. I had so many people say to me, you really like that book changed my life because I was feeling really bad about X. And then I really, really explored it and thought about it. And I realized that I made a really good decision. And that really relieved me of a lot of pain. And I'm very thankful for that. The thing that concerns me is that nobody ever came to me and said, I had a really good result. And I realized, I thank you. Because I realized I didn't actually make a particularly good decision that resulted in that. And wow, you really saved me from making that mistake over and over again. And I think it's because I just didn't emphasize like that side of the equation very well. So when we're thinking about the multiverse, we have to apply that kind of thought. We have to think about those different ways that things could have turn, turned out symmetrically. When I read Thinking Bets, one thing that it helped me was this concept of like that unfolding feature. In 2018, when I read the book, I was like heavy into the job search process. I was really bummed out of my prior job and I was just looking for a new job. And every interview I would go to, I would just think like, oh yeah, I'm going to get the job. Like it's just bound to happen, right? And it helped me to just kind of recalibrate my probability of getting this job, right? I have to set a baseline like, okay, well, I'm probably one of a hundred people applying for this job. So right from the get go, when I submit that application, I probably have a one in a hundred chance of getting this job. And I would update and iterate the probability of, of me landing that job as I go through the process. Just help me, help me to see this unfolding feature. Okay. So let's dig into that example a little bit, because that uh, is the perfect example of why the outside view is so incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. So the inside view was, I'm going to go to this job interview and I'm amazing and I'm a great candidate. Mm -hmm. And so obviously I'm going to get this job, right? That's how we all want to feel, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like, rarely do we say, I'm, you know, I'm going to go on the sales call and obviously I'm going to fail. You know? <laughs> so that's the inside view, what you describe. Like what are, and, and you can sort of describe as your hopes and dreams and like, 
you know, obviously you're not seeing all the other candidates they're, they're seeing and you think you're probably a much better than average candidate for the job. And so you're rating your probability of getting the job at quite high. All right, so how do we discipline that in order to get more equanimity around sort of how we're viewing the situation that we're in? It's to think about two things, how would somebody else view the situation that I'm in, but also what's true of the world in general. And that's where I wanna hone in on something that you said. You step back and you said, well, wait, I'm probably one of 100 candidates that they're seeing. So you were like, oh, so assuming they're all equally qualified, the base rate for me getting this job would be 1%. And all a base rate is, is what's true of the world in general in this, for the situation that I'm considering. So like examples of base rates would be like, what's, what's the probability for somebody like you, you know, applying for a job of you getting the job when, you know, at any point in the process. So like if you send in your resume, what's the probability that you'll get it if you send it? So, so you could also think about like, if I opened a restaurant during non-corona, uh, the probability that that restaurant would still be operating just generally. I'm not talking about my restaurant. I'm saying restaurants in general would be around 40% in a year. Mm -hmm. We could think about like, what's the probability that a 50 year old adult in America dies of a heart attack. We can go look that number up. Okay. So that's totally the outside view. Um, so you went and you thought that you started there and you said, well, what, let me think about what the base rate is. Where am I supposed to start here? Okay, great. Then you went further and you said, but what we want to do is not assume because the world isn't a hundred percent random place. There are things that are particular to me that matter, but having anchored to the outside view, which is a place I want to anchor to, which just kind of like gets me into a place where my optimism and my overconfidence and my illusion of control get some discipline to them. I can now start to think about what are the things that are true of me though, so that I can start to move off of like, how far can I get sort of better than the base rate or sometimes worse, right? So if you were to think about the average 50 year old in America and what their rate of heart disease is, I can think about things that are true of me. Am I overweight? Do I exercise? Do I eat McDonald's every day? Um, if those things are true, I'm not an exerciser, I'm overweight and I, I eat McDonald's, I should probably assume that my chances of a heart attack are much higher than the average. If I say I do yoga and run marathons and I you know, never eat a carb or any sugar and right. So, and so, and I'm like, you know, per, you know, I'm like the ideal BMI, then I should assume that probably I can come below what the average is and I can start to alter that. And that's what you did on top of that, which is, okay, if there's one in a hundred, now let me start to think really, where do I compare compared to the other hundred people? Right. And it starts to get you to actually create a marriage between the inside and outside view that allows you to get a much more objective look at what the future likely holds for you. And the thing is that what's so wonderful about that is that, think about it, like if you're 1% and you say, well, I think I'm like probably on average three times better than the average candidate. Okay, great, so you're 3% now, No, like, right? So, so that gets you into a place where you understand a couple of things. One is your expectations are, or what they should be, but two, it tells you something really important because you can turn it into action. I better apply to a lot of jobs because I think that what a lot of people do is they'll see a job, they think it's a fit, they really overestimate the probability they're going to get it, and so they'll apply just to that job or they'll only apply to five jobs, right, because they're really massively overestimating the chances that somehow their resume is going to shine through and sort through and that all their interviews are going to go well and whatever, and now they have to actually keep doing this in sequence, which is just a huge time waster, right? But if you get a really clear view through this marriage of the inside and outside view, you can actually figure out how many jobs am I supposed to apply to, which then increases the probability you'll actually get a job in a shorter, in, in a shorter time frame because you're applying for all those jobs now in parallel instead of waiting for unexpected somehow bad news and then having to put in a new set of resumes. Yeah, because there's so much outside of your control in this job search process. The funding for that position could get cut another interviewer could do better than you. The interviewer might not have liked the smell of your breath or your cologne. Yeah, right? they could have had a fight with their spouse that morning. Yeah. They could be in a bad mood. It matters whether it's raining or sunny on the day that you come in to talk to them. Yeah. Right? We, we know this from like even, um, you know, judges, right? If they're a sports fan, the sentence you get is correlated with whether their team won or lost the day before. There's all sorts of outside influences that have nothing to do with your skill, you as an individual, what your case is, 
that just influence the way that that interview is going to go that you literally don't have any control over. Those are matters of luck to you. And this is, this is really important, not just for like job interviews, but like sentencing. The, the way the judges sentence people is like influenced by all these like outside factors, you know, is the weather good? Is it not? Did their sports team win? Did they not? You know, so on and so forth. These things are all kind of, you know, influencing these outcomes. And, and that's why we need to so get to the, to the outside view and stop thinking that the inside view is the only thing. And again, I just want to be clear, unless you're playing the lottery where the outside view would be the only thing you care about, you want to actually marry the two. I'm not saying that the things that are special to you don't matter. Mm-hmm. Right. It's just that we tend to only think about the things that are special to us. And that gives us a very poor view of what the future is going to hold. And throughout this process, it is imperative that you kind of focus on optimizing all of those things that are actually directly within your control, right? So right. weather could be shitty, but you could still wear a nice suit and show up dry somehow right. to the interview. You could still come up with good answers and you could still articulate yourself clearly. And it shifted my focus instead of focusing on the result, like, oh my God, I didn't get this job. I started focusing more on, okay, what is in this fear of things that I can control? And let me make sure I execute on every one of those to the best that I can and just forget if I get the job or not. Like, don't even worry about that outcome. I think that's actually such a great way to think about pretty much all decisions, right? There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that isn't in your control. And, you know, depending on the situation, like there are ways that you can hedge against that. So for example, like sending out way more resumes than you think you need to, um, that's, a, that's a way to hedge against the stuff that's not in your control, just like doesn't get past the recruiter or whatever. Um, it's a way to minimize the impact of, of some of the luck. But what we really want to focus on are the things that are in our control that can actually zhuzh us away from the base rate, right? Like we would like, ultimately, if, there, if it is a game of skill, which obviously applying for jobs is, we would like to get a, sort of the most distance between us and the base rate that we possibly can. And that's going to be through focusing on the stuff that you actually can control. One of the ways to figure out what you should focus on is to actually do uh, what's called a, post, a pre-mortem, which is to say, let's imagine I don't get the job. Let me think about why that might have happened, right? So it, you could think like I made a really bad impression because I was unkempt. The interviewer was in a really bad mood and I could tell they didn't want to be there. You know, it could be like uh, my, you know, I wasn't a good match for the job, right? Whatever. You can start to think about what are those things that, that might be true in the case that you failed, what, what are the reasons that you might fail? And then you can start to address those in advance. So you can be thinking about if I walk in a room with an interview who is in a bad mood, what am I going to do about it? Because I have a choice about how I react to that. I may be able to put them in a good mood, for example. I could make it worse. How are the ways that I could do that? And to not just sort of accept, well, these things sit on my horizon, but to imagine what are the things that I can actually change about the situation that I'm in. If someone's in a bad mood, let me think in advance about the ways that I can handle that so that you you don't get in a bad mood, you don't get discombobulated, you don't give a good interview because you weren't expecting someone to come in and be kind of pissy, right? If you say like, I didn't look the part, which I think is a horrible thing because I don't think people should have to look the part. I just want to say that, but let's just talk about the facts of life. Then you can think about like, what can I do to still maintain my personality and the things that I want to be true of me, where I can also be sort of living up to the norms that are expected for this particular position. And that gets you to actually think about, you might go research each company and say, and look at pictures of people and say, you know, is this a company that's very casual? Is this a company where everybody's in a suit and tie? Obviously, I would like to be a little, you know, even if it's a super casual company, because it's a job interview, I want to be less casual than that, but let me try to figure out how I benchmark to that, right? Um, So it gets you to start to think about these things. And by the way, you may come to the conclusion when you think in a space like that, that I don't think people should have to dress a certain way to get a job or look a certain way to get a job. And so therefore, if I think that that's a huge factor, I don't want that job. And that's totally fine as well. But you've sort of explored that and found that out from having done this kind of pre-mortem work that allows you to actually get ahead of things such that you can get more distance between yourself and the base rate. That's an interesting part about pre-mortems is that it forces you to think about all the bad things that could possibly happen. And I think it becomes very uncomfortable to start thinking in advance about how everything can go wrong. Can you talk a little bit more about that negative visualization that you talk about? Sure. So obviously the power of positive thinking is like super popular. But I have a whole chapter in the book called The Power of Negative Thinking. And it's because of what we just talked about, right? I don't think you should have negative goals. 
right? I don't think you should be sitting there going, I think I'm going to fail, so I'm not even going to shoot for the stars over here. Like, I think you should have positive goals, of course. I think the destinations that you're setting for yourself should be amazing. The question is, how are you actually navigating, thinking about navigating to those destinations, which is just your decisions. Your decisions are, are your navigation to those. And that's where I think that the power of positive thinking really kind of goes wrong. Because the power of positive thinking is really saying, like, you're imagining a goal, and then you're imagining just sort of succeeding along the way. And implied, obviously, in that is that if you imagine failing along the way that you shall fail, it will increase the chances that you fail. Now, obviously, depending on what part of the literature you read, that's more, you know, in some places that is more explicit, that causal relationship is more explicit than others. But I think there's no place that it's more, more explicit than The Secret, which was like an Oprah's book club pick, I think, which essentially, I don't know if, we, are you familiar with the book, The Secret? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that, Law of Attraction. Yeah, like okay. That, yeah. So here's, here's the idea of The Secret. If you imagine positive things happening to you, and I'm not just talking about generally positive things, I'm talking specific positive things. The love of your life proposing, extra money coming your way whatever, that if you imagine those positive things that your thought, your thought waves, like if we did an, an EEG, um, have a magnetic quality to them that will attract those things to you. Now, the flip side, they say, is that if you fail, if you, for example, find yourself in really bad traffic in the morning, which is an example they actually give, that you must have imagined failing and attracted that to you. Aside from the whole horrible sort of undercurrent of blame the victim there, which I think is quite odd, obviously the causal relationship is stated explicitly and the mechanism like is super wacky because your thoughts cannot attract the things that you think about to you. That is really bizarre, but whatever. So that's kind of like, I would say like the power of positive thinking, like in its most extreme form would be the secret. But, but this idea of this causal relationship, like think negative you'll get, you know, a bad result, think positive, you'll get a good result. Uh, that's implied in all of that literature. But I think about that as the difference between um, like using a paper map, an old time paper map and ways. With an old time paper map, I think about that as the pos- power of positive thinking. Like, oh, look, here's the place that I want to get to. And I'm looking at this map and the roads are clear. Awesome. Whereas what Waze is doing is really, it's like an instantiation of the power of negative thinking. Where would you like to get to? That's the positive goal. By the way, I'm going to show you all the crap that can go wrong on your route. And I'm going to help you to now navigate around it. So I think it's actually just quite the reverse. It's not that imagining failure causes failure. It's that imagining failure causes success. Because if you imagine failure, you can see all the obstacles that might be lying in your path. And then you can actually do something about them before you run into the obstacle. Because if we don't really take time to imagine those obstacles, then we're going to be reacting to them. That the, something's going to be in your way and then you're going to be trying like a chicken with its head cut off to fix it as opposed to having avoided it, I either avoided it in the first place. That's one thing that you could do. You could just navigate around it. You can take a different route. Another thing that you can do is to imagine how you'll react to it in advance so that you're less emotional when you are so that you already have a plan in place which allows you to be a little bit more nimble. And another thing that you can do is to essentially try to figure out, well, I can't avoid this obstacle, so how can I dampen the effects of running into the obstacle? So that would be like if Waze happened to show you that there was traffic on every road that got you to where you wanted to go, you could just leave with more time. You could leave 45 minutes early, and that will actually mitigate the problem that you see that there's kind of failure on all of those routes, and it's an unavoidable obstacle. So I don't really know how you succeed otherwise if you're not spending a lot of time imagining the ways that things might go wrong. I'm curious, how much, if any, of your work is influenced by Stoic philosophy, if at all? Oh, quite, yeah, a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because, I mean, the, like, it just shines through to me, like, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Premeditation of adversity, and and then this, this Epictetus opens the manual with, you know, there's things in your control and things not in your control. Right. So. So that's, that's interesting that, that that's actually had an impact on your work. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. I, I got a hypothesis on this power of positive thinking stuff. And I'm 
just a dude in the basement. Oh, I'm so excited I, to hear it. Yeah. I don't I don't know anything about this, but I'm just I'm wondering if if so they say thoughts become things. You think about good stuff, good stuff will happen. How much of that is is like just the reticular activating system just kicking in and wanting to see these opportunities and obviously you have to act on it. Does that make sense what I'm kind of trying to get at there? Oh, but. yeah. So so that's interesting. So what I would say to that is that uh, I think Gabrielle Edingen's work on mental contrasting actually shows that the move to action actually comes from imagining the failure. So basically it has to do with this. If you think about like uh, the sort of hormonal release when things feel pretty good, you know, whether it's like prolactin or oxytocin or like all these hormones that we have that we sort of feel pretty good about versus the, the stuff that's kind of going on in like the adrenal gland when we have sort of fight or flight or like anxiety or things aren't going well. That essentially when we are experiencing pleasure or joy or happiness, we have a lot of hormones that are sort of like calming us down. And when we're calm, it's not like really a call to action, right? Like you don't need to run away from the lion when those hormones are kind of going. But when you've got the things happening more that are, you know, in the adrenal gland, that obviously that's what gets you to run away from the lion. So anyway, what she's found um, with the mental contrasting work is that when, let's say, for example, that you have people who say, I have a, they're, they're college students and they have a crush on somebody. And you have one group of those people just kind of like imagine like happily ever after with them, what their life would look like, how amazing it would be. They imagine like this success of this relationship, you know, it's someone that they have a crush on from afar. And then you have other people who sort of think about their crush and they like really go through like, well, what if I were to ask them out on a date and they said, no, like they could say no, you know, or we could start dating and it could turn out to be a sad relationship or whatever. They imagine all these kind of like ways that you might fail. That's called mental contrasting. And then you check in with them later and it turns out that the people who actually did the negative thinking are 30% more likely to have actually asked the person out on the date. And I think it's because when you're doing this positive imagining, you're getting actually a lot of the benefits of, of the success itself, which is you're getting that kind of good feeling that doesn't actually spur you to action. Whereas you're recruiting kind of, there's other sort of hormonal things going that are getting you to sort of run away from the line. In this case, just mean act that actually get you to ask the person out. So I think there's a physiological thing happening there that may be counterintuitive, that the call to action is actually sort of the fear and anxiety of the failure that gets you to actually do the thing. I think also when you've already sort of metabolized the success, the, the sort of negative outcomes, it doesn't, you don't fear them as much because you've actually kind of thought them through. And I just want to say with Gabrielle's work, it's like, it's everywhere. It's like, it doesn't, it's true if you have people in a weight loss program, the, the people who actually imagine failing and like succumbing to the break room donuts or whatever, they're just much more likely to actually lose weight than the people who just imagine success. Like you can sort of pick anything, get a job, you know, the, to get A's in your classes, whatever, like pick it. You, you're better off doing this mental contrasting. I think it actually does call you to action more. So uh, but, but notice that in both cases, you're setting the same goal. I mean, I think that's the key is that you do have a destination that you're trying to move toward in both cases. The question is, I think just is your brain and your body sort of interpreting you as already having achieved it or not? Mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe where the difference is coming from. Much of which, by the way, of what I just said is conjecture. Some of which I think Gabrielle would say herself, but a, a lot of that was sort of conjecture on my part of like what's going on. It's really, really interesting. So I know we're running out of time, but we'd be remiss if we didn't get into your work that you're doing with the Alliance for Decision Education. Oh, thank uh, you. I, I think that's really cool. I think it's really cool. You got a, you got a class in there that's called Habit Wise. And it, it seems, you know, people like people who are better decision makers also have better habits of mind when it comes to thinking about decisions. So how are you teaching these kids um, about the role of habits in decision making? So let me just give a clarification. When we founded the Alliance, which was in 2014, Initially, we were thinking that we were going to create programs and, and, be, and deliver those programs for free um, into school. So first of all, let me just say what the mission is. Um, so all of this stuff that we've been talking about really goes in, in, under the heading of decision education. That's where, you know, Kahneman would sit in there, uh, Angela Duckworth, Katie Milkman, um, Michael Mobison could, would fit in there. Um, gosh, I'm leaving so many people out. Phil Tetlock, Dan Ariely. 
uh, you know, um, I don't know if there's so many people, Don Moore, um, I'm sorry, okay, everybody I did, like, I'll be like at the Oscars, like, I'm sorry for anybody I didn't mention, but uh, obviously there's lots and lots of people who are doing amazing work thinking about, you know, how you can take the, what we know from, like, behavioral economics, behavioral psychology, um, and, you know, apply it in, to adults in, to make them better decision makers. What hasn't happened is that, that this very, very rich body of work, there hasn't been a lot done to sort of translate it down into K through 12 education. So what we're trying to say is like, oh, it'd be really good if we offer decision education in the same way that uh, there's social emotional learning now being offered as a, as a way to really to produce better decision makers and children, because we think better decisions lead to better lives and better society. And maybe we should spend less time teaching trigonometry, which like if you're very important, if you're going to become an engineer, but maybe you could decide to do that later in life when you actually decide that's what you want to do. Maybe we could be teaching more like statistics and probability and really teaching people sort of what a good decision is. So that's, that's sort of what, what the mission is of the organization. And, the, and we sort of frame it as, as kind of two things. We're trying to teach kids to how they figure out what is true and then how they figure out what to do, which is really what we've been talking about today, right? What's true, what, what should you do about it? Okay, so when we first founded, we thought we're gonna create programs, we'll put them into the schools. So hopefully it will help kids become better decision makers, and that's what we're gonna do with our lives. And we did that, and one of those programs was Habit Wise, uh, which is essentially getting people to think about sort of translating, you know, the work of like, you know, uh, Charles Duhigg uh, or James Clear with Atomic Habits, and really looking at Katie Milkman, looking at the, the things that have been, been really good work that's been done on habit formation and you know, sort of what the habit loop is and cues and how you sort of think about your habits and how you figure out which ones you would wanna change and which ones you wouldn't wanna change. And if you do wanna change it, how, how would you go about doing that? Uh, so we created a program for that. It was very popular, by the way. And we did, we did some like whole school integrations for other programs that we have. So we have like a fantasy football program, which is teaching probabilistic thinking and cognitive bias. We have a program which is called uh, Mindful Choices, which is really about sort of figuring out the emotional component to decision making. Put that into schools, got amazing results in some cases. In one school, the kids who were getting the programs, their math and English scores and science scores went up like between 10 and 15%. We weren't teaching math and science. And their disciplinary uh, uh, actions went down by like 5%. So uh, great results. So we thought at the time, oh, this is great. We'll just go tell other schools about how great our programs are. Yeah, yes. And they'll adopt them. And it turned out that's not, that didn't happen. Because, you know, because what they always say is, okay, we really like your programs. That's awesome. But what do you want us to take out of the day? We only have a limited amount of time. To totally get it. And, and the other thing is like, you know, education is just a really, it's a hard boat to turn around. Very bureaucratic, right? So... What we said was, okay, we're still gonna offer these programs, which you do, you can look up habit-wise on the Alliance and you'll be able to find it. And if you're a teacher and you wanna actually teach that in your class, you can. But we sort of changed the way that we were executing on our mission to become a field builder. And essentially what we were thinking about actually a lot about the model behind both STEM and social emotional learning and how that became really a movement within education. And it turns out that in, in those cases where you get these, these big movements in education, there's an organization or more than one organization that's working behind the scenes to try to create awareness around the field. Like if I think about 25 years ago, I didn't know social emotional, it wasn't a term that I knew. So you're trying to sort of define the field, what the boundaries of it are, what the things are that would fit in there in the same way that happened with social emotional learning. And then you're trying to bring uh, different people like players and stakeholders into that, that movement, whether it's the teachers who would be delivering it, whether it's the parents or the students who would be getting it, the businesses that might wanna hire people and have them skilled up in this area, colleges who would want to make sure that the students that they're recruiting would have really good decision skills, so on and so forth, and, you, and legislatures and you know, uh, people who are policy makers. And you try to get them all to start talking to each other and create a dialogue around this field in order to get that, um, uh, to be in schools the same way that now social emotional learning is pretty ubiquitous within the school system. And there was an organization with social emotional learning that was called Castle that was working for about 25 years. And it was a good like 15 years into that, that all of a sudden everybody started talking about social emotional learning. So we sort of pulled back and decided to model ourselves on that. And we're really sort of connectors, funders, really trying to accelerate this field. We're awareness raisers. 
We do still offer programs, but a lot of what we're doing is sort of connecting schools that are interested to program to programs, researchers who really want to think about how to apply these things to K through 12 and to see where you can get really good change. We, we connect them with schools that would be interested in having people come into studies. Uh, we're helping to fund academic research around K through 12 in terms of decision education, so on and so forth. So that's, that's really what we're doing now. And excited that you asked me because I'm obviously, I love, I love what we do there. I think you guys are doing some, some awesome work there that thank you on behalf of all the kids that you're impacting. I think that's oh, great. Thank you. Um, so I know we're running short on time here, but last formal question, then we'll do a couple of quick random round okay. questions. So a hundred years in the future, Annie Duke, what do you want to be remembered for? Oh, hmm. yeah. Just be, I, I just want to remember for being a good mom. Awesome. That's an easy one. So we'll jump into a real quick random round here. What song do you have on repeat? Oh my gosh. You know, it's so interesting. I haven't been, I just, I don't, I haven't been listening to as much music as I did before. And this is my fault. I should have more intention around this because I, I sort of watch the news all the time, which is so depressing and awful. So I shouldn't do that. But in terms of, uh, Songs that I might have on repeat, it would certainly be, I, 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 basically, anything by Jack White, I listen to a lot. There was a period where I was listening to Hamilton on loop. Nice. Um, uh, and I got to say, Lemonade is a pretty strong album, so I'll listen to that on a loop, too. Nice. What book are you reading right now? I just finished, actually, a book called How to Change, which is going to come out in the spring from Katie Milkman. Uh, everybody should keep their eye out for that one. That one, that one is actually a habit change book. Um, oh, awesome. It's fabulous. It's really, really good. But you can't, I guess you can't get it till the spring. So that's not a nice, that's not yeah. a nice recommendation, I suppose. Uh, everybody should read The Biggest Bluff in the Psychology of Money. Yeah, I uh, started digging into uh, Maria Konnikova's work and try to get her on the show. Let's see what happens. Um, I really want to yeah. talk to her about game theory and, and all the stuff she did. What do you think is the most bizarre aspect of human nature? I don't, you know, gosh, bizarre is such an interesting word there. How, you know, I would say it's that given how freaking uncertain the word, world is, like how damn sure we are that we're all right. Every single one of us. Like, I just find that so bizarre. Yeah. So, Annie, how can people connect with you? Where can they find you online? Where can, get the, where can they get your books at? Yeah. So uh, you can find out pretty much anything about me at AnnieDuke.com. Uh, you can find out how to order my books, although they're available at all the usual places. I do have a contact form at annieduke.com and I would love it if people reached out to me because I, you know, I'd say the biggest contributor to how I decide is actually conversations with people who had written to me. I like to hear from people who listen to me or read my work or whatever. It's where I get, I, I get a tremendous amount of learning out of that. I'm not a hundred percent on responding. I, that's my goal, I'm about 90% on it. Uh, so if you don't hear back from me, it doesn't mean that I don't appreciate you and love you for having written in. Sometimes things get buried in my email box, and I apologize for that. Um, you can also find me on Twitter, obviously, um, at Annie Duke. Um, you know, and then if you check out the Alliance, I'd be really appreciative. Annie, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here. I really appreciate you coming on the show. It has been an honor to speak with you. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for having me.